The Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. Our mission is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy, expose the evil devices of Satan, warn believers what is coming to America, challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart and to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie. Using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, son, you must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we provide information and resources with a prophetic warning message to win souls to Jesus and to call people to repentance. Our topic tonight is the secret of Solomon's key, revealed. Like the fictional character Robert Langdon in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, Michael Hargard reveals from the Illuminati the most darkest diabolical secrets in the world. Using the elements of scripture, numerics, biblical typology, and the prophetic word of God, Michael reveals the truth behind, the meaning behind the sacred design of Washington, D.C., God's longitude, Freemasons using children to bring in the new world order, the hidden truth behind the Star of David, the real reason for stem cell research, and a new understanding of the mark of the beast and the number 666. Will you help me welcome our speaker tonight, Michael Hoggard? Thank you very much. Good to be with you tonight. Appreciate that. Appreciate you being here. It's good to be here once again with the Prophecy Club and you find people. And uh, what a joy it is to stand here. I love God's people. Amen. I love being with them. There's nothing in the world like them. And, and I'm just thankful that God has allowed me here. Several years ago, God established some things in my heart uh, concerning what we're going to be dealing with tonight. And, and just in the progression that we're going to show these things tonight. Number one, that the King James Bible is the Word of God. It is where the truth of God is. And God said every word in this book. Do you believe that? Say amen. Okay, I believe it. And uh, I live by it. This book has saved my life. Then God began to show me some things out of the Scriptures concerning Bible prophecy, Bible typology, stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament that reveal prophecies for us who are living in the last days. And I believe that we're there right now is where I believe that we're at right now. We're there in the last days. Then God began to show me Bible numerics and how the numerical code of the Scriptures. God uses numbers in the Bible and He uses them for a reason. One of the most enigmatic numbers in the whole Bible is the number 666. And we're going to see something I think is brand new that's going to be fresh for us tonight. An understanding of what that number is all about. I don't think I have all the answers, but I think we're headed in that direction and I'm excited about that. And then several years ago, we uh, put out a book called The Babel Conspiracy. The Prophecy Club did a video on that, the scripture numerics of 9-11. And God began to show me some very, very interesting things that were going on in our world and in our country. By the way, they're still going on right now. They're still going on. This Virginia Tech killing is, is part of that. And I may allude to that tonight as we move on. But anyway, those things are still going on. And um, then God began to, last year... I read the Da Vinci Code. We did a video on that, and God showed me some things from that. Uh, that was written by Dan Brown, and I found out a few months ago that Dan Brown is writing a new book called The Solomon Key, or that's what we think it's going to be called. And uh, it's going to deal with Freemasonry in America and the Freemason establishment of this country. And so I began to, I was intrigued by that. And I began to look at that and began to look into it, trying to... And see, last year when I did the Da Vinci Code, I was about three years behind the book coming out. And, uh, but we were kind of right on target with the movie coming out. And this year, I hope to be ahead of him with all of this stuff. But whether I deal with what he's going to talk about or not, the things that God has shown me in the last two or three months has just absolutely just blown my mind. It's made the doodads run up and down my spine. You ever had those? Amen? That's how the Holy Spirit's telling you something's going on, right? But uh, some interesting things that God has shown me, even in the last few weeks, 
and I'm just thankful for it. And, uh, but let's just get right into the presentation here. I want you to take a look at this symbol up here. And uh, what do you think that, what, what, what comes to mind when you see that symbol? Okay, you see a pentagon. Okay, actually that's a six-pointed figure. Okay, what, 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 nat what naturally comes to your mind? Star of David and the nation of Israel. Okay, now I want you to look at something here because I believe that God designs his own symbols. Amen? I believe that, in fact, God is better at it than we are. Okay, this is a symbol that was graven by art and man's device. That's out of the book of Acts, okay? And we have to be careful about symbols that are graven by man's device. But yet when God designs a symbol and establishes it, then you know that it's the truth. Now take a look at that symbol and then take a look at that. That's called an Easter lily. And remember there in the, uh, in, the te in the temple that God had Solomon design and build, that on top of the two columns that he had there, God told Solomon to put lilies up on top of that, okay? And remember the Song of Solomon. Who is the lily of the valley? Who is that? It's Jesus, and it was a picture of Jesus. And Jesus told us, he said, consider the lilies how they grow. He said, look at the lilies, look at the design. I like God's symbols better than I do man's. Amen? By the way, God's symbols smell better too. Amen? Okay? They just, I mean, I just like them better than that. So what I'm going to show you is, even though Israel has, has sort of grasped onto this symbol and claimed it as their own, God has a better one for them. And the real meaning of the symbol is, is Jesus Christ because he's the lily of the valley to the nation of Israel. Can I hear you say amen? You love Israel tonight. Say amen. Okay. Now, let's, let's get into some scripture numerics here. This is not going to be a complete covering of all the numbers that are in the Bible, but I'm going to cover a few of them tonight just so that you have a basis. I see some of you writing this stuff down. You're going to need that because there's going to be a test later on, okay? But the number five, the number five in the scriptures, the Antichrist. In, by the way, in the King James Bible... The Antichrist is mentioned five times in the King James Bible. Satan is mentioned 55 times in the King James Bible. And devils are mentioned 55 times in the King James Bible. Okay, Just kind of get that in your mind there. That's the number five. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, we see that Lucifer has a five-point plan for dominating planet Earth. He said, number one, I, I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And number five, look at this, seven words, I will be like who? The Most High. He is going to replace God so that he is God sitteth in the temple, you know the verse, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Ezekiel chapter 28, the Bible says concerning the prince of Tyrus, and that's very important because we're going to see that later, but it's a picture of Lucifer, and he says, I sit in the seat of God. Ezekiel chapter 28, notice that, okay? This is very important, but that's what that number five represents. So when we see a symbol graven by man's device, how many points are on this thing? One, two, three, four, five. Notice Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded. Notice we have a repetition of the number 5 here. The fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. A star fall from heaven. Remember Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer. We see a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the what? The word key is very... See, we're dealing with a key, aren't we? We're dealing with what Freemasons talk about is the key here. God began to show me these things. We're going to be dealing with Freemasonry tonight. And I want you to know, if you're here tonight and you're a Freemason, I want you to know how much I love you. And I really mean that. I love you with all my heart. And I want to tell you the truth of what God has shown me. I didn't get this truth from the Masonic Lodge. I didn't get this truth from Albert Pike. I didn't get this truth from a Mason. I got this truth from the Word of God. And I want to show you that tonight. And if you're watching this video and you're in Freemasonry, I want you to know that God has a better solution for you. If you just want brotherhood, hey, I know a brotherhood. Amen? 
the brotherhood of Jesus Christ. And I know a lot of churches have masons in them. I don't want to be your enemy unless you make it that way. But I just want you to know that I love you and I care enough about you to tell you what the truth is tonight. And after you watch this video, after you see this presentation, then you decide. You decide. And if you don't believe a word I say, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your Bible out. And I want you to begin to read it. And I want you to get along with God. And you ask God, God, is this something you want me to be in or not? Does that sound reasonable tonight? God, is this something you want me to be in or not? Okay? So anyway, but these, a lot of these symbols I'm going to show you are from Freemasonry. But to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Notice we have a fifth angel sounding. Notice we have a star fall from heaven. And we have a movie. I talked about this last year. I talked about this in some other videos that we have. A movie called Starman came out in the mid-80s. Notice the symbolism here, a star falling from heaven. And what are stars in the Bible, by the way? Angels. Keep that in mind. That is so important because last week, God just solidified this thing for me right from the Scriptures, something about stars that I found out last week, okay? This, I can't hardly wait to get to it. It's so cool, all right? But anyway, notice the star falling here. And what is this movie about? We talked about this, but what is this movie about? Jeff Bridges plays a, 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 an angel, an extraterrestrial, a, 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 a something that's out there. And he falls to the earth, and he takes on a human form. He meets this woman. He mates with her and produces a child in her. This child is a hybrid, a cross between a human woman and a star man. Now, is there something in the scriptures that tells us that? We're going to look at that in a minute, okay? Very interesting already. This is, we're heading to the secret of what Freemasonry represents. The word Christ, I love this, the word Christ is mentioned 555 times in the King James Bible. And this was really cool when I put this together. See, Christ, mentioned 555 times, defeated Satan, who was mentioned 55 times, with exactly 55 words in the King James Bible, quoting from the fifth book of the Bible. Somebody say amen. By the way, when he was on the cross, they pierced him how many times? One, two, three, four. And Satan got his defeat with that fifth piercing, didn't he? Hallelujah. Amen? Oh, man. So that's, that's the number five. Now let's look at the number ten. What does the number ten represent? It's a, it's a perfect number. It represents completion. Okay? How many commandments? Ten commandments. Think about that. Okay? The law. Okay? But watch this. In Ezekiel 28, God is describing for us Lucifer. And I believe that's talking about the devil, don't you? Thou hast been and eaten in the garden of God. You see, it's only the Bible scholars who don't believe that stuff anymore. Amen? Okay? But he said, Thou hast been eaten in the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Sardius, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold. How many stones there? Ten stones was the covering of Lucifer. This is very important. Keep this in your mind. Okay? Keep this in your mind. Then we look at Deuteronomy 4.13. 4, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even what? Ten commandments. And he wrote them upon what? Two tables of stone. I'm giving you clues here as to where we're headed. Daniel chapter 2, verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet... By the way, why am I mentioning toes of the feet and the number 10? There's 10 toes, amen? Unless you're a giant, right? They've got 12. They're all messed up. Giants are hybrids aren't they? There's something different about them. We're going to head that way here in a few minutes. But I want you to know, that notice that the, the kingdom that God shows to Daniel, that last day's kingdom, that fourth kingdom, ten toes here, and there is a biblical reason why. By the way, I just, we just read the secret. We just read the secret, and I'll explain that in a minute. Revelation chapter 17, and the ten horns, how many horns? Ten, and who's that on? The beast. Uh, John said, I saw a beast with seven heads and ten horns. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Now notice the symbol that I have next to this verse here. Okay? 
What are Freemasons known for when they greet one another? Secret handshakes. I read part, I'm still reading it, it's a big book. I read part of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. Now, in case you don't know who Albert Pike was, Albert Pike is referred to as the grandfather of Freemasonry in this country. If there was anybody who knew the secret of Freemasonry, it was Albert Pike, and he never really actually quoted it in this 800-page book, but he, he walked all around it, and he said that the handshakes reveal the secret of Freemasonry. So when I meet, if I were a Mason and I meet another Mason, and I shake that Mason's hand with this, one of these funny handshakes, I have five fingers on this hand, he has five fingers on his hand, how many does that make? Think about it, okay? Think about that ten, and think about those ten kings, and Lucifer with those ten stones who covers him, okay? Just keep those in your mind, we'll see that more in a little bit. Notice we have a story here. I, this is typology. Go back and read this, 1 Samuel chapter 25. David is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abigail is a picture of the church. She's a virtuous woman. But her husband is called Nabal. And Nabal is described in this chapter as a son of Belial. And notice that God smote him that his heart died within him. There's a word there I want you to pay attention to. And it became as what? Stone. And for how long? Ten days. Take a look at it. This is going to make more sense a little bit later on, but I'm laying a framework for you. Does anybody recognize this symbol here? Does anybody know what this is? Anybody? This is called the Sephiroth. I notice that nobody here is into the Kabbalah. That's good. Okay? I'm relieved to see that. Madonna is in the Kabbalah, right? Okay, that's who she has decided to side with. By the way, I'm, I'm, going to talk about the, I'm going to talk about the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism. I'm going to talk about Freemasonry. I'm going to talk about the Newage movement, because it rhymes with sewage. Amen? Okay, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about Rosicrucianism. I'm going to talk about all these occult things, because they all tie in together with this one secret. Okay? They all link together with this one secret. Okay? And so, but this is the Sephiroth. This is the Kabbalah tree of life. The Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. It is everything that God told the Jews not to learn from the Canaanites and the Babylonians that they learned. Okay? And they incorporate or they mingled it with their Jewish traditions. And they come up with this thing called the tree of life. Now, if you'll notice here, there are ten circles in here. And all these crisscross paths, they form about 22 paths. Now, that number is important, too. But they form about 22 paths. And I haven't done a lot of reading into Kabbalah. It's really, really, uh, it's a mystery religion, and it's very hard to understand the literature. And anybody who's in it is going to spend a lifetime trying to figure all this out, and they'll never get anywhere. They'll die and go to hell. Truthfully, Amen because they have abandoned the truth of the Word of God. But see, they're trying to find light. They're trying to find or reach the next stage of man's evolution. Or they're trying to have their, their third eye open or receive illumination. There's a word for you right there. They're trying to receive illumination. And they believe that going through these paths here, with these ten circles and these 22 pathways, they believe that going through that, they will reach what's called transformation, and they will be transformed into like a being of light or something like that. I don't quite understand it. But see, that's what Freemasonry is all about, right? When you reach to go through the levels, you are illuminated. You receive the light of Freemasonry. That's what witchcraft was about. That's what the New Age movement is about. That's what all these cults are about. It's about receiving light and illumination. Even the Mormon church, which is based on Freemasonry, amen? There's, been vi there's videos back here that talk about that. They talk about man who will become gods. Think about it, okay? And this is where we're headed with this, okay? Notice that it has ten... Now, I'm, I'm having you look at that because we're going to see it a little bit later on. Now we switch to the number 23, equals death and sacrifice and crucifixion in the Scriptures. Notice the number, Luke 23, 23. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. That word crucified there. This is the 23rd occurrence of that word. Now, the number 23 is an interesting number in the Scripture, and it is a basis for what we're going to talk about tonight. 
Because if you look in your King James Bibles, you will see that the serpent spoke exactly 46 words to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, which is 23 times 2. Okay? You follow me so far? If you get your King James Bible and you start counting all the words that Lucifer spoke in Genesis 3, you'll find exactly 46 words there. And what was he trying to do with her, by the way? He was trying to get her to disobey God and follow him, right? Now I want you to notice back up here again, there are exactly 46 chromosomes in the human cell. God designed us, didn't he? Okay? 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs, okay? Look at Romans chapter 12. Now, think, think about the number 23 being the number for death and sacrifice. Look at that verse there, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Somebody say amen to that. God designed it into us, and the devil's trying to take advantage of it. Okay? I want you, this is so important. I want you to remember that. The number 33. The phrase the beast is mentioned 33 times in the King James Bible in the New Testament. Beast, just that word beast, is mentioned 132 times, which is 33 times 4 in the Old Testament. Christ was 33 when he died on the cross, showing the destruction of the beast or the man of sin. The 33rd word spoken to Eve in the Garden of Eden was the word eyes. When he said to her, your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods. Okay? Now, think about Freemasonry and the number 33. What does that have to do with anything? In the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, there are 33 degrees. Okay? We're gonna, that, this is having to do with why, by the way. Okay? Now I'm going to talk about something that is absolutely over everybody's heads, and I expect you not to understand most of it. Okay? Because I don't. Okay? We're going to talk about the fourth dimension. What is the fourth dimension? Is it a 70s rock group? No, that was the fifth dimension. Okay? The fourth dimension, I want you to notice Ephesians chapter 3, if you would, okay? Take a look at this verse. This, this boggled me for a while, and God showed me what it was. Paul said that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the one, breadth, number two, length, number three, depth, and number four, wait a minute. I thought that there were three dimensions, I thought that if you looked inside of a box, you would have length and breadth and depth in that box, right? But notice in this verse that he is mentioning a fourth direction, a fourth dimension. By the way, ask any mathematician, is there a fourth dimension? They'll tell you, yes, mathematically, we know that there is, okay? Our problem is we don't know what direction it is, okay? And yet God showed us in the pages of our King James Bible what direction the fourth dimension was in. It's called height. Notice that fourth direction there in Ephesians chapter 3. It's called height. Take a look at this verse. Three dimensions or directions, breadth, length, and depth. The fourth one is called height. Notice what Job 22 verse 12 says. Is not God in the height of the heaven? Now, heaven is not part of this universe, is it? It's not part of this world. Anybody that says heaven's on earth, they're lying. Amen? I've got a headache right now that disproves the fact that heaven's on earth. Amen? Okay? Heaven is not part of here. It's up there somewhere, and God calls it the height. It's a fourth direction or a fourth dimension. We refer to it in the scriptures as the spirit world or the spirit realm. This is where angels reside. This is where... Jesus is right now. This is where God is right now, okay? By the way, there's an upper one and a lower one. You follow me so far? The lower one, okay? Look at Psalm 102, verse 19. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. Notice that he's associating the word height with the word heaven, showing you where it's at, and it's part of a new direction. The number four in the scripture almost always indicates the fourth dimension. Notice that one of these days, you and I are going to get to go to a new city called New Jerusalem. Notice how it's built. And the city lieth how? Four square. He's telling you of the fourth dimension in the scriptures. Now, this is really important, so, so I, just, I just want you to get this in your mind, that there's something else besides what we see here in this world. Now, notice Daniel chapter 7, verse 19. Then I would know the truth of what beast... 
the fourth beast. If God's fixed this number upon this beast, he's telling you something about where he comes from. If he's the fourth beast, he's not from the world that exists where length and breadth and depth exist. The spiritual world. And notice that he's a beast from the fourth dimension. That sounds science fiction, doesn't it? Okay? But just do a study on this in the scriptures and you'll see that it's true. Okay? Notice he's trying to give you something. He's trying to give you a clue here. And he was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of what? Iron. You remember those ten toes that Daniel saw in Nebuchadnezzar's vision? They were part of clay and part of what? Iron. That's very important. Okay? And stamped the residue with his feet. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. Then he said, the fourth beast shall be the what? Fourth kingdom on the earth. The fourth kingdom that is going to rule over the earth is going to be ruled by, not by people of this realm, but by things of the spirit realm. How many of you believe that is true? Say amen. Watch this. Watch this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, let's count, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness and hype. How many of them? We're not wrestling against flesh and blood in three dimensions. We're wrestling against fallen angels and spirits and devils. Amen? That's why our weapons of warfare cannot be carnal. That's why they have to be spiritual. Amen? You, by the way, you can't, you can't exercise a demon out of somebody with a crucifix. Why? It's three-dimensional. It's matter. Amen? We're, de we're not dealing with flesh and blood. We're dealing with the spirit realm. Okay? Uh, let's see here. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, Break it in pieces. Everybody take a look at that little symbol there. What is that? It's a diamond or a square. Now, th this is real simple stuff, right? Okay, this is not trick, trick questions here. I think I know the answer, but... Okay? Yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a lousy circle. By the way, it's funny that you said that, because I'll show you something in a minute. Okay, about that in a circle. Anyway, this is a diamond or a square. And how many sides does it have? Okay, so this symbol references something that deals with what dimension? Fourth dimension, okay? So if I were to show you this, this is Washington, D.C., we're talking about something different, aren't we? We're talking about something that I think is where a secret is, okay? Or part of the secret. Notice the diamond shape of Washington, D.C. By the way, it was done like this on purpose, okay? This just didn't happen. It was done like this on purpose. Let's deal with the number six because we're headed towards 666, right? Notice that God created man on what day? The, on day six. Let's look at the verse. And God made the beast of the earth, the beast, think about it, after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said... Let us make man in whose image? God's image. Amen. By the way, I like this. Let's count this. God said, let us, make, let us make man in our image after our likeness. How many? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Amen? King James Bible. By the way, all the other Bibles take that verse out. That's 1 John 5, 7. Okay? 1 John 5, 7. But anyway... God made man in his image. And then, and he did it on the sixth day. And then God gave man dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and the beasts. Now, how many of you believe that man has dominion? Say amen. Okay? In spite of what the environmentalists say, and Al Gore, okay? God gave man dominion. Now, I'm a preacher, and I believe the scriptures, and I'm not one of these guys that's going around, name it, claim it, this and that and the other. But I'll tell you, if God said that man has dominion, man has dominion. And see, we're not just dealing with 
earthly beasts in that dominion, are we? Because Lucifer is a serpent, isn't he? That's a beast, isn't it? And I'll explain this here in a little bit. Has God given us dominion over him? Yes. By the way, just resist him. Amen? And he'll flee from you. Now, I believe that God has given man, especially a born-again Christian, dominion over that. So stop and think about this for a minute. Let's see how the devil sees this thing. God created man on the sixth day and gave him dominion. God made man in God's image, gave him dominion over everything. What's the devil going to try to do? Because we see in Revelation 13 a beast rising up out of the sea and he is given dominion over man. Think about it. Okay? And how is that possible? We'll see that in a minute. In Genesis chapter 6, this is crucial because if you don't believe what I'm going to tell you concerning this, you're going to waste your time with the rest of this video. Okay? This is absolutely crucial. The writer says, Moses said in Genesis chapter 6, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which they chose. Now, who are the sons of God? Who are the daughters of men? I'm not going to spend much time in this video trying to prove to you what I'm going to tell you. There are other videos and other books that have been written about this. Search the scriptures and ask God. But the scriptures reveal to us that the sons of God are the angels. Go read the first two chapters of the book of Job. Go read the Psalms. They'll tell you in there. Okay? The sons of God were angels. The daughters of men, simply that, daughters of men. And it says in verse 4 that there were giants in the earth in those days. Do you believe that? Say amen. And also after that, before the flood and after the flood, because the Israelites saw them when they went into Canaan land, David killed one. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. Now, some people ask, how is that possible? I thought, I thought that, um, that angels were spirit beings. Well, they are. They are. Okay? But remember, in the Scriptures, every time you see an angel in the Bible amongst men, what does that angel look like? Looks like a man. And did you know that those two angels that accompanied Jesus on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah, they even sat down and ate what Abraham and Sarah prepared for them? Think about it. Is it possible? Yes. Some would say, well, doesn't that violate what Jesus said, that in the resurrection we shall be as the angels of heaven, which neither marry or are given in marriage. That is true, but notice that, number one, Jesus said the angels of heaven. We're dealing with fallen angels, okay? And there's something neat about this I'm going to show you later on, okay? Hopefully it makes some sense to you, okay? But this is crucial to understanding what the secret of Freemasonry really is, is that the sons of God, fallen angels, mated with human women, and produced a race, a hybrid race on the earth, okay? A hybrid race on the earth. And the writer says, Moses says, that these became mighty men, which are of war of old, men of renown. You know what he's telling you there? He's telling you to look at every civilization on the earth and look at their, what we call their mythology, which actually it is. But every one of them have a story about the gods coming down and mating with human women and producing children. You ever heard of Hercules? He was one such character. That's where he got his strength, by the way. Okay? So I believe that, number one, number one I believe it because the Bible says so. And number two, the Bible itself is telling you to look at history. And history tells you that this event really happened. Now remember this. Because Solomon said, that which was is that which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. This happened in the days of Noah. And what did Jesus tell us? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. This event happened once. It's going to happen again. 
And everything about Freemasonry is telling you that. Everything about Freemasonry is telling you that. Are you intrigued already? Say amen. Should I go on? All right. Notice what it says also in Genesis 6 about Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and what? Perfect in his generations. Literally, his genetics. Because, and we'll see this verse later on, but I'm going to go ahead and give it to you now. Because the Bible actually says in Genesis 6, God's looking at the earth and he sees that all flesh has been corrupted. All flesh has been corrupted. How? By mingling the seed. Yes, sir. Okay? By mingling the seed. And the, one of the reasons why God favored Noah is because he found grace in the eyes of... By the way, I like that. I like that. It didn't say that Noah was perfect and everything and did, never did anything wrong. It says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And you know why Noah found it there? Because he went looking for grace. You want to find grace? Go looking for it. Amen? Now, think about this number. Here is wisdom. God's trying to tell us something. Let him that hath understanding count the number of who? The beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So let's put these things together real quick, okay? We have in the sixth day of creation, the creation of man. We see in the sixth chapter of the Bible, Genesis 6, the recreation or the corruption of man by the angelic seed. So think about this beast and why he has that number. 600, 3 score, and 6. Let's move on. Take a look at this symbol. Now we superimpose that Star of David thing that we saw, that hexagram, over this Vitruvian man of Da Vinci, from the Da Vinci Code. How many points are in that little circle there? Six. Okay, think about it. So if you see this symbol three times consecutively, what have you got? Take a look at it. This is from an old Masonic handbook that you can download from Google. Okay, notice the symbolism there, 666. Six, six. By the way, if you just look at this page, every symbol on this page is telling you the secret of Freemasonry. If you know where the key is, okay, if you know where the key is, you can look at these symbols and go, I know what that is, without even being a Freemason. How about that? Amen? All right? Now, let's talk about DNA. I love this. I love this. Okay? The chemical and mechanical structure of DNA wasn't discovered until the 1950s. Okay? So we're talking about in the last 50 years, our knowledge of how we are made and how life is made is, is just coming to fruition here, but God knew this all along because he made it. And God inspired David to write something down. Look at this verse. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, David is referring to God's book. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Let me tell you what David is describing here. Because what we know of DNA is that DNA is written exactly like a book. Including what's called stop DNA, which is periods at the end of a sentence. And it's actually, instead of being written in a book kind of like this, it's actually written like if you, like you remember ticker tape, okay? If you had like a three million mile long ticker tape, you would have the sentence structure of DNA written on that long ticker tape. And then you kind of, we're going to see a picture of it. It's kind of twisted, right? Okay? Just kind of keep that in your mind because we're going to see that. And David saw this by inspiration of God. And David said in thy book, by the way, this is the book. This is the book. The book of life of DNA and this book match perfectly. Why? Because God said, let us make man in our image. Are we learning something tonight? Are we, are we cluing in here? Okay, this is the book, okay? And so David said, in thy book are all my members written. In other words, he is saying everything about me, my fingers, my eyes, my hair, my skin color. The Bible described David as ruddy, which means he was red-headed, freckle-faced. 
right? Okay? And God, does, God wrote him out to be that way in his DNA code. But when David was conceived, those initial cells of his conception, the embryo stage, didn't look like anything. Our abortionist people say that's just a glob of chemicals. How sick are they? Amen? I don't care if that makes them mad or not. Okay? But they didn't look like anything because there was yet none of them. Look at that verse. There was yet none of them. But the DNA coding for how they were going to be was already written down in their DNA. And then it began to form. By the way, that initial glob of cells is what we call stem cells. Now keep that in your mind, because we're going to see this again, okay? There is a human cell, okay? Or actually, it's a drawing of a human cell. I should clarify that, okay? Notice you have like a cell membrane around the outside. How many of you remember your high school biology? Okay, you have the cell membrane, membrane, and then you have the nucleus of the cell, right? At the center of the cell. And in the nucleus is where the chromosomes are. So now, how many chromosomes did we say we had? We had 46, 20, they're paired in 23s, right? 23 times 2 is 46. Okay, that's very important, okay? And inside the chromosomes is where the DNA is stored, is where the book of the law. Now, everybody look at this for a minute. This is the human cell. The outer wall is the cell membrane. You have the cell nucleus where the most holy place is, and the most holy place is where the book of the law was kept. Somebody say amen. That just makes the doodads go up and down my spine. Amen? When God said that you're the temple, he wasn't joking, was he? He designed it exactly that way. I mean, take a look at it again. There's the cell. The chromosomes are stored in the most holy place in the cell nucleus. There it is. Somebody say amen. Man, I like that. Now, watch this. Solomon built a temple. We're talking about Freemasonry, aren't we? Solomon built a temple according to the scriptures. He set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Jachin. And he set up the left pillar, and he called the name therefore Boaz. These pillars were exactly 23 cubits tall. Both of them. This corresponds to the 23 chromosome pairs where the DNA is stored. By the way, can I tell you a secret that Freemasons say? See, I don't believe in keeping secrets, amen? Freemasons, Freemasons get together in their lodge and they won't even tell their wives what's going on in there. Freemasons say, now we're going to give you secret names for God. Jabulon. Now don't you tell anybody what we just told you, right? But see, I like the scriptures. Jesus said, what I whisper in your ear, you shout from the rooftops, amen? So I'm going to tell everybody what's going on. But Freemasonry says that the secrets of Freemasonry are stored in Jachin and Boaz. Now remember what Jachin and Boaz now represent. They represent the human chromosome pairs where the DNA is stored. So does Freemasonry... Ha and, and you know what? I I'm going to show you something that they didn't just think about this when Watson and Crick discovered the, the mechanics of DNA back in the 50s. I'm going to show you that the devil read the same Bible that you and I did. And he was in Eden, the Garden of God. And the Bible says in Ezekiel 28 that he is wiser than Daniel. And remember, Daniel knew the secret. I'm going to show you that Daniel knew the secret. And the devil was wiser than he is. Okay? Take a look at this. This is the structure of DNA. It looks like a ladder, doesn't it? Keep that in mind. Is there a story in the Bible that has a ladder in it? Think about it. Okay? But it's twisted, right? Okay, it's twisted. There it is. That's what it kind of looks like, okay? Now, I have a book. I bought a book here a few weeks ago. A lot of this stuff, I'm, I'm trying to get it out as, as fast as I can because th some of this stuff just came on me in the last month, okay? Because Stan said, let's do a video April 23rd. And I said, I'm not ready, okay? So, man, I've been praying and studying, okay? But I got this book called The Cosmic Serpent. I don't encourage you to read it. But it was part of my study. And he found, the author of this book found this DNA structure in some ancient things. This is a thing from one of his books. This, this takes back probably a thousand years before the time of Christ. Notice the two snakes. 
Okay? And it deals with a serpent god. Okay? By the way, who's the serpent? You know who the serpent is, right? Okay? How about this? Okay. Notice the similarity here. Okay. Notice this one from ancient Sumeria. Okay, the Sumerians. By the way, there's all these people trying to figure out Bible prophecy by reading what the Sumerians wrote. The Sumerians were wicked people. Don't, you don't have to read the lost secrets of Enki or anything like that. You don't need to read Zechariah Sitchin or anything, any of these guys. You, don't, you need to read your Bible if you want to know what God's going to do in the last days. Amen? But notice the similarities here. Here is a Peruvian textile from 300 years before the time of Christ. Okay? And all of these, all over the world, they had the same religion. They had different titles, but they had the same religion. Okay? Now, even in the, even in the Eastern mysticism, in the New Age movement, there is a thing called Kundalini. Has everybody, anybody ever heard of that? Okay? If you talk to anybody that's ever practiced yoga or anything like that, they will tell you about kundalini. Kundalini is some practice where you, where you empty your mind out and go into this chant thing. And the belief is, is that at the base of your spine, you have a serpent all coiled up there. And through, this, through these rituals that you perform, through all these things that you do, that you release that serpent to uncoil itself up your spine to reach your pineal gland and open up your third eye. This comes right out of Genesis chapter 3. Okay? Remember who the serpent is. By the way, by the way, you know how many spines, you know how many backbones you have in your spine? Guess how many? 33. 33. What's the number, high number in Freemasonry? And it's about illumination. When this serpent goes up the 33 backbones of your spine, you receive illumination. Think about it. Think about what they're... And, and since they're using this coiled serpent, and we saw what that represented here, DNA, think about what the secret represents. How many of you remember a rock group called Sticks? Back when you were lost, say amen. Okay, you used to listen to them. By the way, Sticks was the river that flowed through hell, right? They had a song called Serpent Rising. And the lyrics of this song go, In the abyss of space from the center of time, a Superman race right out of Genesis 6, moves the serpent to climb. The secret revealed when you leave your cave is a glory of thunder and life from the grave. Remember what the devil told Eve about God and the, and the fruit? Ye shall not surely die. What are the alchemists searching for? The philosopher's stone so they can reach immortality so they'll never die. You see, you need to stop and think about this. Jesus said, if you follow me and become my disciple, ye shall never die. Somebody say amen. Okay, man, I like that. And by the way, that's easy. There's simplicity in Christ, isn't there? Get saved, go to heaven, live forever. The devil has got an alternate plan for you. And it's very difficult, and it's very hard, and it won't work. Won't work but he's offering it to billions of souls all over the world, and they're following it, okay? They're following it. The rest of the song goes, the serpent is rising and coiling in your spine, bringing you light from the depths of your mind, okay? These guys were being told the secret that we're sharing with you tonight. Let's talk about another thing here, heavenly creatures, okay? Let's look at what the Bible says about animals that are not part of our world. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of what? Four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness. By the way, what did we say that number four represented? The spirit realm, the fourth dimension. And where do these come from? They come from that area, okay? Everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. We're talking about fourth dimensional creatures called cherubims. Revelation chapter 4, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were, here we go, four beasts. The first beast like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast like a man, the fourth beast like a flying eagle. Revelation chapter 6, And I saw and behold a white horse, a white horse, right? 
And where does this horse come from? Does it come, does the devil hop on top of a, of a horse out of somebody's stable and ride it? No, 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 no. We're talking about a fourth dimensional creature. And there went out another horse that was red, okay? A fourth dimensional creature. And they opened a third seal. And there was a black horse. Then he opened the fourth seal. How many seals? Four. And we have four horses coming out. And they're not of this world. They're of the spirit realm. Okay? So when we see the word beast in the Bible, and we see a certain prohibition concerning beasts in the Bible, we should pay attention that we're not just talking about earthly ones. We're talking about heavenly ones as well. Okay? Notice Revelation 19. I like this one. And I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Who is that? Jesus. And he's riding on a horse, isn't he? Fourth dimensional. Okay? And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a what? Beast. Rise up out of the sea, having seven heads. And how many horns? Ten horns. We saw that number already. And, and on, upon his horns, ten crowns. Now think about this beast. It's not from the earth. This is not some European man that rises to power. That doesn't make sense scripturally. We're talking about something that is not of this world. You follow, does everybody follow me so far? Good. Daniel chapter 7, and four great beasts came up from the sea, sea diverse from one another. The first was like a lion, okay? The, uh, another the beast, the second like unto a bear. The uh, third beast was like unto a leopard. He's referring you to Revelation chapter 13. Notice this, and after this I saw the night visions, behold a what? He's telling you where it comes from. The fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, it had great what? Iron teeth. And it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had what? Ten horns. Think about this. We're going to put all this together here in a few minutes. Has everybody got this so far? Everybody wrote all your notes down and you understand everything perfectly, right? Okay? You'll have to get this video and go back over it again. And then get in your Bible and study these things out and ask God, God, show me some things here. Okay? So all I've done now is waste time by laying a groundwork. But I had to do that so that the rest of what I'm going to tell you is going to make sense. Because now we're going to talk about the great secret of Freemasonry. Okay? And um, in preparation for this, I began to see things. I began to see symbols and so on. When I was doing research with the Da Vinci Code, I began to look at things, and I'm going, I, I see that, but I don't know what it means, and I would like to know what those mean. And I read all kinds of Masonic literature. I read literature out of all kinds of things saying that they held a great secret, but they never told you what that secret was. And I read and I read and I studied and I, and I just couldn't find anywhere where the secret was actually written down anywhere. And that bothered me. And I said, God, you know my mind. I like to know secrets. God... I'd like to know this one, okay? And God, in that still, small voice, said, Mike, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible, and I'll show it to you, okay? And I'll tell you a little bit later how I found it. It's amazing, but it's real simple because there's simplicity in Christ, amen? I'm not going to teach you something hard that you'll never figure out. I'm just going to give you simple stuff from the King James Bible because that's where the secret is is it's in the scriptures and i'm going to show you that notice this room here that we're looking at here on this graphic this is a masonic temple in fact this is the interior of the masonic temple in called the house of the temple in washington dc okay take a look at it there the layout of this room and everything about it is revealing to you or showing in some way the real great secret of Freemasonry, okay? And they, Freemasons love to do this thing in front of everybody because they know that you don't know what it is. Has anybody in here ever received a grip from a Freemason who was trying to find out if you were a Mason or not? Okay, got a brother over here. Felt kind of weird, didn't it? What's this guy up to? And if you're not a Mason, you don't know what that is, but he does, and he knows that you're not a mason, okay? So they do it in plain sight 
but it's all secret. And they, and, 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 and I'll tell you this, what I'm going to show you tonight, most Freemasons do not know. They are led to believe that they know what the secret is. And even Albert Pike said in Morals and Dogma, he said, only make people think. Only make Masons think that they know what the secret is. But they don't. We lied to them. That's what he said. Okay? So let's find this out. This secret is, is referred to in the Da Vinci Code. Get that video that we did last year on that. Part of that is there. Dan Brown's new book is going to deal with this, The Solomon Key. How many of you saw the movie National Treasure? Okay? The secret's in there. It's in there. Okay? It's hidden and it's covered up, but it's in there. There was a booklet written by Francis Bacon back in the 1600s called The New Atlantis. And everybody understands that Francis Bacon was referring to this country, the United States of America, as a new Atlantis. He wrote about landing upon this island where these builders had built, rebuilt Solomon's temple. And uh, I, it's just a complicated thing, but it's an allegory of the United States of America. But he's talking about the secret in the new Atlantis. It's in the Mormon church, by the way. It's in the Mormon church. They are, by the way, Joseph Smith was a Freemason. And all of the early leaders of the Mormon church became Freemasons when they were in Nauvoo, Illinois. Okay? It's in the Vatican. It's in a lot of places. This secret is. Okay? So we're going to look at some things tonight. Now, as we said before, Freemason, Freemasonry deals with the building of Solomon's temple. Now, that is a real event, is it not? Okay? And here's a... It's, this is actually a Freemason graphic. You'll see there uh, to the left, King Solomon. And you'll see two men standing there next to him. These are both men by the name of Hiram. Okay? The man sitting down is Hiram, the, the widow's son. And notice that he has a compass in his hand. That's a Freemason symbol. And standing behind him is Hiram, the king of Tyrus. Okay? Now, biblically, Solomon employed these two men to help him build this temple that he had built for the glory of God, okay? And there behind you, you see the Freemason rendition of Solomon's temple, okay? Now, but remember, the word temple from the Scripture doesn't just mean this building here, does it? What did we say that it meant? The body. Know ye not that your body is the temple. So think about that. When we start thinking about Freemasons and rebuilding the temple, think about it, okay? By the way, the word Hiram or Hurum is mentioned exactly 33 times in the King James Bible. Now, remember what I said. God showed me that the secret of Freemasonry is right here in this book, okay? We're going to see that plainly tonight. What is the temple? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And he said, if any man does what to the temple? Defile the temple. How many of you have ever smoked a cigarette? Say, okay, yeah, a few of you. You ever drank alcohol? You ever ate too much bacon? See, these are things that we refer to as defiling the temple, right? But you know what? We're all guilty of it one way or the other. If that's it, then we're all guilty of it. But it appears to me from the Scripture, and I'm going to show you verses that will indicate to you that we're talking about a greater defilement of the temple that has to do with stem cells. Okay? Okay? a greater defilement of the temple that has to do with that. And Freemasonry is involved in that. Defiling, the, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. What did God do in the days of Noah? He destroyed all the temples, didn't he? Because they were defiled. Okay? Here's what the Bible says about Hiram. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Hiram, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God. Look at that. 
Let me ask you a question, okay? How many of you have Jesus in you right now? Say amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, okay? And where does he live? Does he live in your hands? He lives in your heart. Where's the seat of God right now? It's right here, isn't it? Okay? Just keep that in mind. So when the devil says, or when Hiram says, I sit in the seat of God, what was it said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? For there shall come a falling away first, and that man, man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, so that he is God, sitteth where? In the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Wow. Okay? Albert Pike wrote in Morals and Dogma, he called the secret the Grand Arcanum. And he said that secret whose revelation would overturn earth and heaven. And he was right. By the way, it dawned on me yesterday, as I'm looking at this graphic here, that the entire structure of the World Trade Center compound, all seven buildings, were Freemason symbols, including the Twin Towers, which represented Jacob and Boaz. And they were destroyed, weren't they? And a new one is rising up in its place, right? In the video that we did, the biblical numerics of 9-11, I show you a tarot card called the Tower. And the tarot card shows a tower collapsing just like these were and a new one rising up in its place. If these towers represent Jacob and Boaz, if they represent the human genome or the genetic structure of human beings, they're torn down and a new one rises up in its place. Are we starting to understand some secrets here? Okay. Albert Pike said, it is for each individual Mason to discover the secret of Masonry by reflecting upon its symbols and a wise consideration and analysis of what is said and done in the work. Masonry does not inculcate her truths. She states them once and briefly, or hints them perhaps darkly, or interposes a cloud between them and eyes that would be dazzled by them. Seek and ye shall find. Where's that from? The Bible, knowledge, and the truth. Albert Pike is telling you where the secrets are. Albert Pike associates this great secret with the discovery of the alchemist's philosopher's stone. The philosopher's stone and the secret of Freemasonry are the same thing. And here we have children all over the world who are being indoctrinated into the great secret by reading Harry Potter books. Isn't that amazing? devil's good at what he does, isn't he? We're having a hard time getting kids to show up for Sunday school in our churches. Can I hear you say amen? But, but folks, we're not losing the battle. Amen? We are not losing the battle. A book called The Masonic Ladder, written in 1866, you can download this from Google, says that the Bible is full of Masonic secrets to the initiate. Notice we have a Masonic Bible, and what does it have on it? A square and compass. Notice this symbol here of a square and compass on top of an open Bible. By the way, this is an apron, and it's not just any apron. This apron belonged to Meriwether Lewis. Does anybody know who that was? Lewis and Clark, okay? He was a Freemason, dispatched by Thomas Jefferson, who was a Freemason, from St. Louis to expand westward, Okay? I don't know what all that means yet, but I think we're on to something here, okay? From Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. For the master, the compass of faith is above the square of reason, but both rest upon the holy scriptures and combine to form the blazing star of truth. Even Albert Pike is telling you that the secrets of Freemasonry are in the, the Bible, the scriptures, the King James Bible, by the way. The Great Masonic Truths, this is from a, another book written in the 1860s about Freemasonry. He says the Great Masonic Truths concealed among the learned of former ages under allegories and fables are therefore lost. Long, long lost. 
But what is lost is not consequently destroyed. What is lost may be found, and all that is required is some clue or key. Fortunately, there are applicable keys held sacred by a body of men who know not their use. And the locks these keys fit are held sacred by all modern clergy and the multitude of religionists. The first and best evidence of the truthfulness of the keys is their being used to interpret the Bible, that heavenly book of truth. They're telling you where the secrets are. Now, I told you that God spoke to me and said, Mike, it's in the Bible. Okay, God, that's a big book. Could you narrow it down for me? And one day God just said, Mike, what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking for the secret. And God said, then look at the word secret. There's simplicity in Christ. Amen? God makes stuff easy for us. If we'll ask, we shall receive. So God said, Mike, look at the word secret. Let's look at this. Deuteronomy 29, the secret things belong unto who? So even if Freemasonry says we have a secret and we're not telling anybody, guess who already knew? Amen. God already knew. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto who? Belong unto us and to our children forever. Psalm 139, 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made how? Notice that David is associating the secret with how we are made. For the froward is the abomination of the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. God says that if there's a secret that men are trying to keep, I will reveal it. Okay? So if you're looking for the real secret of Freemasonry, don't bother asking the Masons. They're not going to tell you. Don't bother asking the mystery religions of the world. They're not going to tell you. Ask God. He said he would tell you. My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my what? Secret place. For the robbers shall enter into it and do what to it? God said that the robbers are going to come in and defile the secret place where the DNA is stored. Dun, dun, dun. Amen? Are we learning the secret by looking at the word secret? Cursed be the man, watch this, cursed be the man that maketh any grave in a molten image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman. By, by the way, Freemason refer to their work as the, the craft. The work of the hands of the craftsman, and putteth it where? God said, do not put an idol, an image, in the secret place. Okay? Daniel chapter 2. That they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. That Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel. Daniel found out the secret because God... And you remember what this was about? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he couldn't even remember what the dream was. And he was looking for somebody that could tell him both the dream and interpretation and none of Nebuchadnezzar's men could do it. And Daniel said, God, would you show it to me? And God said, sure, you ask. Amen? And so he knew that the secret was revealed unto Daniel, and it was. Daniel is the 27th book of the Bible. Now, why am I telling you this? Look at this verse. He revealeth the deep and the secret things. Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. Now, remember that Daniel is the 27th book of the Bible because I'm going to show you a Masonic symbol that tells you where to look for the secret at. Take a look up here. In the royal arch degree, Masons form with three hands up, three hands mid, and three feet together. It's called the formation of three times three times three. And what is that? It's 27. 
God was telling, Masons are telling you where the secret of Freemasonry is. 27th book of the Bible. Hmm. Now let's look at the secret. Remember what I said in Genesis 6 that you really have to believe. Okay? Watch this. Daniel chapter 2, that they would desire mercies of God of heaven concerning this secret. Verse 19, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, and whereas thou sawest iron, we saw that before, mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. What is the seed of men? What is, what is it in our terms? DNA, his genetic code. And who are they that are mingling themselves with the seed of men? The fourth kingdom, fourth dimension, the angelic realm, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And you see that word iron there? Guess what I found out last Wednesday. This is how new this is, okay? Angels are stars in the Bible, right? They interchange, right? I saw a star fall. The devil took one-third of the stars... Okay? Now we know that the stars up there in the galaxies, that when they fall, they don't, they're not gonna, like, they don't land here on earth, right? But there is a way that stars fall. And I read this. No, not asteroids. I read this. I read this. You check this out. A star has all this nuclear energy going on inside of it, right? I mean, it's just a mass of energy. A lot of heat, a lot of explosions going on. And I found out that stars... All the time they're doing this, slowly but surely, these stars are forming iron in their core. And as time goes on, more iron develops inside their core, and all of a sudden there's too much iron in the core to sustain the star, and the star falls in on itself, and it's called a nova or a supernova, and all that's left is this cloud of gas, and this chunk of iron. Isn't that amazing? See, God designed it, didn't he? God made it that way. He wanted you to know the secret. And this idol that Nebuchadnezzar built in relation to the dream that he had, in relation to the secret, was 60 cubits tall and 6 cubits wide. He's telling you sixes, isn't he? God's trying to tell you the creation of man and the corruption of man right here in this image right here. Genesis 6. Now, does it make sense now what Genesis 6 is all about? The creation of man and the destruction of man because the angels came to human women and they created new men. Heroes, mighty men a superman race upon the earth. And remember what it said about Noah. He was perfect in his generations. That's why, and by the way, I'm setting you up for the very end of this because at the end of this video, you're going to make a choice. Okay? You're going to make a choice. Okay? Look at Genesis 6 again. God looked upon the earth. Behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. The word corrupt is mentioned exactly 33 times in the King James Bible. Somebody say amen. Now remember what we've said, that, that the secrets of Freemasonry, the secrets of what we're talking about, are in the Scriptures. Now take a look at this verse right out of the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verses 23 and 24. Take a look at it. Notice what God wrote into the law. He said, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast... Remember beast, fourth dimensional beast, to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is what? It's confusion. It's mingling. God said, don't do that. And so, and there's been science fiction stories written about this. How about some mad scientist? H.G. Wells wrote The Island of Dr. Moreau. A couple of movies have been made about that. Where this mad scientist figured out how to mix animal DNA with human DNA. And he had all these weird hybrid creatures running around. God said in the law, don't do this. Now, if God decided that he didn't want this done and he put it into his law, not only does it have, duh, a practical reason for it, amen, not only does it have a practical reason for it, 
but it has a prophetic reason as well that the woman should not lie down with a beast. And remember, when we go back to Genesis 6, that's exactly what the daughters of men did. They became the wives of the fourth dimensional angelic beast creatures and lied with them. And God said, don't do that. Verse 24, God said, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And God was referring to the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and all of these ites that were in the land of Israel. Seven nations, by the way, or excuse me, seven, here we go. Okay, Seven nations, by the way, how many heads did the beast have? Seven heads, these seven nations that were in the land of Canaan that God wanted destroyed, God said that they were defiled. How? Because they were lying with beasts. And God said, I want you to destroy those. By the way, God showed us that those nations were inhabited by giants. So when we look in the sixth book of the Bible, there's that number again. It's the book of Joshua. And Joshua and his armies went in to destroy the giants out of the land. But he didn't get all of them, did he? Some of them were retained there. And it's possible, I don't know this yet, this is preliminary, but it's possible that the bloodline of those giants still existed in that land after the time of Joshua. We know that it was around in the time of David, but from David on were all of those people destroyed. That's what I'm not sure about, and that waits for, that's the next video, all right? Anyway, notice what the Bible says about giants. Notice the number six here. Six fingers, six toes on these giants. God is telling you where they came from. Notice that Goliath was six cubits tall. Notice that he had a spearhead uh, that weighed 600 shekels of what? Iron. There's that iron again. The God, Bible's trying to draw these things to your knowledge so that you'll understand where they came from. Then we have the beast, 603 score and 6, and he's telling us where he comes from. Now the word seed in the Bible equals DNA or genetics. Now notice what this verse says. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, this is Genesis 3, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Take a look at this graphic here. Serpent seed equals the children of Belial. The woman's seed equals the children of God. Now I want us to look back at this verse again. Take a look at it. Because God only describes two seeds or two bloodlines here. That there is going to be a war. There is enmity. There is going to be a war. And it only involves two bloodlines. Number one, the pure bloodline of the woman. The woman's seed of whom Christ was. Somebody say amen and the defiled bloodline of the serpent's seed. Only two types of children or two types of people on planet earth, I believe, in the last days. Either the children of Belial or the children of God. You decide whose side you're going to be on. By the way, the children of God win. Amen? Amen. It's not maybe, it is absolute. So you decide whose side you're going to be on. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 13. Certain men, children of Belial. Who's Belial? He's the devil. By the way, the word Belial. I just saw this the other day. The word Belial mentioned 17 times in the King James Bible. You know what the number 17 indicates? Transformation. What happens in Genesis 17? Abram is transformed to Abraham. Sarai is transformed to Sarah. What happens in Matthew chapter 17? Jesus was transfigured in front of the disciples. Belial being mentioned 17 times, that tells me something. That he is the method or the, the name of transformation. Notice Judges chapter 19, sons of Belial. Judges chapter 20, children of Belial. 
1 Samuel chapter 2, sons of Belial. 2 Samuel 23, sons of Belial calls them thorns. And there's 1 Kings chapter 20. By the way, the Damien movies, the, the Omen movies, Damien's last name was what? Thorn. Okay? They're telling you part of the secret. 1 Kings 21, 13. Children of Belial that witness against Naboth. By the way, the vineyard there. Jezebel was after what? The vineyard. And in all the readings I did about DNA and the occult, they equated the DNA double helix, the twisted double helix, to things like a ladder, to a twisted rope, or a vine. Because of its twisting nature. Okay? This is how they saw that. And Jezebel was after what? She was after the vineyard where the vine was, and she used children of Belial to get it. Jesus talked to the Pharisees, and he said, Ye are of your father, the devil. You see, there's something I want to point out to you. He said, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, Acts chapter 13, thou child of the devil. See, Freemasonry, when you, when you look at a, a if you, and I, nobody will ever do this here, hopefully, but in the Freemason Lodge, you see they have this altar here with a Bible on it, a King James Bible on it. And generally that Bible is open to Psalm 133. And Psalm 133 tells us, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Or men together, I can't remember which one, men together and, or brethren to dwell together in unity. Freemasonry talks about the brotherhood of man, the fraternity of all men. And they're using that term as a secret symbol telling you their secret. Because if all men are brothers, that means they have the same what? Father. Same seed, same DNA, the same Father. And that is their goal, to bring about the fraternity or the brotherhood of all mankind. And who's their Father going to be? Thou child of the devil. Now let's look at some Masonic symbols, okay? Some things that you might have seen that didn't make sense to you, okay? How about this one? Who knows what this is? The Ark of the Covenant? All right, no, it's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. No, okay, okay. The, yeah, the Ark, of the, the Ark of the Covenant, okay? What does the Ark of the Covenant represent in the Bible? What is it? Mercy what? Remember when the devil said, I sit where? In the seat of God? What was he talking about? Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant, Okay? He wants to sit in the seat of God, doesn't he? He wants to sit where God sits. This is the throne of God. The Ark of the Covenant is the throne of God where God sits, okay? And, uh, and these cherubs that are around it, okay? Now, this is really, really neat. This is on my neat list here because I want you to look, Revelation chapter 4, and before the throne, the throne, the Ark of the Covenant, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were how many beasts? Four beasts. You see the four beasts in Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel sees the same thing. And he sees that these four beasts, they're bearing up the Ark of the Covenant. How many Levite priests were, were supposed to be used to get it? You, they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They were an earthly representation of a heavenly thing. Isn't this cool? It gets cooler than this, by the way, because the real throne of God, we all talked about this a while ago, the, the real throne of God is, it's in your heart. How many chambers in your heart? Yeah, wow, amen. Yeah, the real Ark of the Covenant, the real throne of God. Now watch this. The real throne of God is the human heart. Yeah. Four chambers, four cherubs, four creatures, four Levite priests. It's all there, folks. It's all there. Now, I got something better than that. Look at this. A graphic representation of what John saw in heaven. He said, I saw the four beasts and the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God. And he said, I saw 24 elders surrounding the throne. Now remember, God made us in that fashion. And the... Huh? He's, he's, look at this. We have 24 ribs that surround the throne of God in our bodies. Somebody say amen. We are really the temple of the living God. Amen. 
Now keep that in mind. See, the doodaddies are going up and down. Amen? Now watch this. Where did the devil say he wanted to sit? Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, this threw me for a long time. I was looking at this, and I said, God, this doesn't make any sense. See, God told Moses exactly how to make the Ark of the Covenant, because it meant something. And he said, they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Now, I, I've read a lot of scriptures, and I've seen, I look at numbers in the Bible, and I, I, don't, I don't remember a time when I saw something and a half, something and a half. Usually I saw whole numbers in the Bible, and I like that because I hate fractions. Amen? I don't like fractions. I like decimals a whole lot better, okay? <laughs> and I run a Christian school. Anyway, okay. But I kept looking at this. Two cubits and a half, a cubit and a half, a cubit and a half. There it is right there. The base of it was 2.5 cubits. Part of the base was 1.5 cubits. And the height was 1.5 cubits. And I said, God, what does that mean? What are, you, what are you trying to show me there? And so I just kind of got my calculator out. That's what I studied the Bible with, by the way. You use a Bible, Webster's Dictionary, and get a calculator. Amen? Okay, because he said count. And I started doing things with that, you know, like uh, the volume of what that would be and so on. And I did something, and it, I had to go back and look this up. The formula for the surface area of the Ark of the Covenant, the surface area, what, how much space each side of the Ark takes up in this world, okay? The number that I came up with is 19.5. Okay, now, that may not just ring all kinds of bells in you, and it didn't me either for a long time. But I'm going to show you some amazing things with this number right here, 19.5. Take a look at this symbol from an old Masonic book, the symbol for Royal Arch Masonry. Notice the four creatures there, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. The, the four-chamber heart, right? Notice the Ark of the Covenant circled there. And down at the bottom, we have a symbol there and, and a phrase there called holiness, to the Lord. Do you see that there? Holiness to the Lord. Now, where does that come from? Does that ring a bell to anybody? They got that from the scriptures, right? The Levites. Because Aaron, the high priest, was supposed to make a breastplate covering his heart, and on it was supposed to say, Holiness to the Lord. I looked in the Bible. Guess where that's found in the scriptures? It's found in the 78th chapter of the Bible, which is 19.5 times four. Remember, the secrets of Freemasonry are in the King James Bible. Are you, are you starting to be convinced now? Okay? It gets better than that. Okay? Take a look at this symbol. Okay? Now remember that Star of David that we saw, graven by art and man's device. Okay? I still like God's version better. Amen? Okay? This is from a book, and I'll show you the title of the book here in a minute. But I want you to notice how this Star of David is a mingling of things that are opposite. Notice the white, the black, the up and down of it there. That's very, very important, okay? Notice the, the serpent entwining around this. It's called the Ouroboros or something like that, okay? It, it means something, okay? Here's another version of it. This is from Transcendental Magic from Eliphas Levi, which is a pseudonym. You can download this book from Google Books, okay? And I want you to notice the symbol here, what they call the Star of David. Notice that we still have the same elements here, the man, the ox, the lion, and the eagle. And so we're talking about the, the, the heart, right? This is a symbol for the heart, the human heart, as it were. And I'm going to show you something else here. Take a look at this. This is a graphic drawn by Leonardo da Vinci of a tetrahedron. You see, when you, use, when you have that Star of David in three dimensions, it makes basically three, uh, uh, tri or two triangles intertwined together, one pointing up and one pointing down in, a, in, in three dimensions. Now, when you place that tetrahedron inside of a globe, the points at which 
the points of the triangle touches the surface of the globe is exactly at 19.5 degrees. Okay? So imagine these two tetrahedrons in a planet like the Earth. And where they would be touching is exactly 19.5 degrees on either side of the equator. Are you with me so far? I'm trying not to make this complicated, but this is what it is. The st that, that storm on Jupiter is at 19.5 degrees from its equator. Okay? The largest volcano on the Earth is in Hawaii, and it's at 19.5 degrees. The largest volcano on the planet Mars, Mons Olympus, is guess where? 19.5 degrees on Mars. Okay? There's something there, but it's, it gets bigger than that. Okay? Notice, notice we have here again this Star of David in a circle. Notice the elements here, the man, which is a sphinx now. This is a Masonic symbol. A man, an ox, a lion, and an eagle representing the human heart and the Star of David there. Okay? Because we're going to place this Star of David, and it represents the Ark of the Covenant, the seat of God. Take a look at this here. This is the street layout of Washington, D.C. In the center here, you have the nation's capital, where Congress meets. Take a look at this area right here. What do you see? You see a format of the street layout. Let's draw some lines in that. Take a look at it now. It's there in the layout of Washington, D.C., the point of which touches our nation's capital. Wow, I got more than that. Now remember this. Here's da Vinci's Vitruvian man. When we take da Vinci's man, which was drawn correctly, we place it inside of a circle and put that tetrahedron there, the line that intersects at 19.5 degrees crosses where the human heart is. It's the Ark of the Covenant, the human heart. Da Vinci knew this. Remember what we learned from the Da Vinci Code that they said that he was the Grand Master of the Priory of Zion, which some people say never existed. I say that it did. And I say that Da Vinci knew something like this. Okay? So that, remember, that line across there represents where the human heart is. So when we go back to this layout of Washington, D.C., and on the top there where the capital is at the apex and where that line goes across, guess where the human heart would be there? It's right where the Supreme Court building is. Okay? Where they have on the doors of the Supreme Court the Ten Commandments. Okay? Written in stone. Think about it. Okay? Take a look at this. How many of you have seen this symbol on the right before? It's called the yin yang. Okay? And notice that the two dots there, representing the summer solstice and the winter solstice, fall exactly on 19.5 degrees. Okay? And how did we get this yin-yang symbol? How did they come about it? Well, the Chinese figured out that if they stuck a pole in the ground, a giant pole in the ground, and they marked where the, where the, uh, where the shadows of that pole went throughout the course of a year, that it drew that design. Pretty interesting, isn't it? So if you're traveling to D.C. in the near future and you see a giant pole stuck in the ground... Guess what it's doing? In a course of a year, it's drawing the yin-yang symbol, which has to do with the mixture of opposites. And here it is. The opposites are sons of God, daughters of men. Sons of God, daughters of men. Are we seeing something now? Sons of God, daughters of men. That yin-yang symbol, sons of God on one side, daughters of men on the other and what it is that they produce. Sons of God, daughters of men. Now, the street layout of Washington, D.C., it has evolved over time. Charles Linfont was a Freemason, and he did the original design of it, but he and George Washington got into some fights over how they wanted it laid out, and so he got fired, and another guy was brought in. Okay, I don't remember his name offhand. But this is Charles Linfont's original plan for Washington, D.C. Now, I want you to notice in the lower right-hand corner, 
that he laid out the degrees of where this city was supposed to be. The latitude was supposed to be 38 degrees or almost 39 degrees. And notice that the longitude is set at zero degrees and zero minutes. Why? Remember from the Da Vinci Code how that the original prime meridian was set in Paris, France. And they called it the Rose Line. And Dan Brown revealed that the Rose Line indicated a special bloodline. Okay? But then the prime meridian was moved and the original drafters of Washington, D.C. wanted to establish a new prime meridian in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Was, was anticipated at being longitude zero, a new rose line. And I found out that this is actually was called God's longitude. And it gets pretty complicated, and there's some things that I don't understand. But it has to do with the vernal equinox. You know what that is? The first day of spring on March 21st. Incidentally, it's the day, there's only two days of the year where there are 12 hours in the day and 12 hours at night. Okay? Now, in the 1600s, when, they, when, they, when, the, when the England finally decided to change its calendar after the Roman calendar, Pope Gregory, the Gregorian calendar, they decided to do so because they wanted to, to fix this in a special place, a place where on March 21st was the only place in the world where on March 21st you had exactly 12 hours in the day and 12 hours at night. Did, I, did that make sense to everybody? In other words, on March 21st there was only one place on the whole earth where there was 12 hours here and 12 hours here on that particular day. And they found out that it was on this particular longitude where Washington, D.C. is. And they called it God's longitude. Now remember what Jesus said. Know you not that there are 12 hours in a day and 12 hours in the night, right? But actually there's only two days out of the whole year that that's true on, and the first day of the year that that's true on is March 21st, and the only place that it's true on on that day is in Washington, D.C., okay? Now, that gets pretty complicated. That's even over my head, but I thought I'd share it with you anyway, okay? But they wanted to establish a new rose line, but it, they didn't get to set it at zero degrees, zero degrees, so they settled with a number called 77, it's all through the Bibles. Christ's genealogy was 77 in Luke chapter 3. The word church is used 77 times in the King James Bible. And so this longitude, the number 77, denotes the house of God. Remember what the house of God is? The temple. They're telling you the secrets of Freemasonry by the placement of Washington, D.C. on God's meridian. There it is, you see, 77 degrees. And notice that the top part reaches the 39th parallel, or 39 degrees. And we'll look at that number. And in Washington, D.C., Washington's monument is exactly 555 feet tall. And remember that Christ was mentioned 555. They took that right out of the King James Bible. The devil knew this. The secrets of Freemasonry are in the scriptures. 555 feet tall on the 77th meridian. Christ is mentioned 555 times. The church is mentioned 77 times. And the 555th chapter of the Bible is Psalm 77. And it's 19.5 books into the Bible. Psalms is the 19th book of the Bible. And Psalm 77 is roughly 19.5 books into the Bible. And you know what Psalm 77 says? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Yeah, the temple, the house of God. Are the secrets of Freemasonry in the Bible? There they are. George Washington was a Freemason, by the way. And here is a painting depicting him laying the cornerstone of the Congress building. And in a Masonic ceremony, they use oil and wine poured over this stone Okay, and why do they do that? Because Jacob took a stone and poured oil and wine over it and called it Bethel, which means the house of God. And the word Bethel is mentioned 66 times in the King James Bible. Wow. Remember Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma? He says every lodge is a temple. 
representation of the body. And the word lodge is used 27 times in the King James Bible, three times, three times, three. Wow. Okay? Now take a look at this for a minute. Here again, another aspect of the layout of Washington, D.C. You can see um, the uh, Washington Monument. You, you can see the Capitol building there on the far right. Well, let's look at it like this now because that angle draws a compass for you and that angle is set at exactly 39 degrees. Okay? Yeah. Okay? Now, you're getting ahead of me, so I'm glad nobody else heard that because that, this, is, this is neat, okay? Because the word compass is used exactly 39 times in the King James Bible. Wow! It is amazing, isn't it? Now, watch this. When God gave the first law, He used exactly 39 words. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. The first law. And how many books are in the Old Testament, by the way? 39. It's the law, isn't it? By the way, aren't you glad we're under grace? Amen? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Take a look at this. Dollar bill, right? Notice what I have circled there, the 13 stars, and if you draw lines around them, you will find the star of David, the human heart. Okay, there it is. And notice that we have opposites on this eagle here. We have peace on one side, the olive branch, and we have war on the other side. Okay, the union of opposites, sons of God, daughters of men. Notice the pyramid, 13 letters here, 9 letters there, M-D-C-C-L-X-X-V, and then 17 letters there. How many letters total? 39 letters there, Masonic secrets there, okay? And we have a, somewhere, I, I counted this and somebody else counted this for me, 72 stones in this pyramid here. Now, they may not ring your bell, but I'm going to show you something here, okay? Watch this, okay? Because on the National Archives building, these were built by Freemasons, designed by Freemasons. There are 72 columns on this building. And this is where the movie National Treasure was located, right? Because that's where the secret was. That's where the Declaration of Independence was in this building right here. Now, going back to Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah says that there is a name of God that has 72 Hebrew letters in it. And that when this name is uttered, you receive illumination. And by the way, I also found out, watch this. Has anybody ever heard of what's called the golem or the golem in Jewish, Jewish myth? There was an old science fiction movie made about it. The golem was a stone statue that when the 72 letter name of God was uttered, the stone came to life. Revelation chapter 13, go read it. It's right there. Okay, gets better than that, okay? The 72nd chapter of the Bible says, Whosoever lieth with a beast shall surely be put to death. Gets better than that. The Pentagon, you see it? The outer angle of the Pentagon, 72 degrees. Watch this. In the King James Version, Christ sent out 70 disciples. How many of you believe in that? Say amen. In all of the mod translations, Christ sent out 72. Dun, dun, dun. You know what they did here? They changed the book. Uh-oh. Now think about that for a minute. Okay? By the way, the tribe of Dan mentioned 72 times in the King James Bible. And God said that Dan shall be a serpent by the way. And Dan is not mentioned in Revelation receiving an inheritance. I wonder why. Okay? Dan and Bethel are the two places where Jeroboam set up golden calves, idols in the temple. Look at these Masonic symbols here. On the left-hand side, the symbol for 33-degree Freemasonry. Notice the double-headed equal. Um, eagle, Albert Pike, says that that is the eagle facing in two directions, one direction, the other direction. It represents the union of opposites. Sons of God, daughters of men. 
Notice on the right-hand side, you have the square and compass. He says that that represents heaven and earth. It represents the union of opposites, sons of God and daughters of men. The beast mentioned 33 times in the King James Bible there. Notice that's what the square and compass represent. The 33, back, the 33 spines in the backbone. Now, this brother figured it out a while ago. You have that 39 degree angle there represented by the compass of Freemasonry in Washington, D.C. And notice that there is a, uh, what they call the National Mall that bisects that 39 degree angle in Washington, D.C. And when you do that, you have exactly 19.5 degrees. Now, you say, well, that could just be random chance. Hang on a second. Because notice that the apex of that angle puts you at the Capitol building. Does anybody know what's on top of the U.S. Capitol building? A statue of a goddess, a woman. Guess how tall she is? 19 feet 6 inches. Exactly. Check it out. Look it up. I'm telling you the truth. And does anybody know what happens every four years at this exact location... At 12 noon on January 20th, which is exactly 19.5 days in the year, the inauguration. Okay? They changed it, didn't they? Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Are we learning something? Are the secrets there? Okay? They're telling you something. Now remember this, the Sephiroth, the Tree of Life, the Kabbalah. Okay? This is DNA, by the way. Okay, this is a picture of DNA, and uh, I could talk all night about that, but just kind of get that in your mind. By the way, the 10, the 10 circles and the 22 paths, that equals 32, that's the normal range that you can reach in Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The 33rd degree is conferred upon you, okay? And it represents DNA, it represents uh, illumination, the ten horns there, we saw that, we talked about that a while ago, represents the ten kings that are going to rule over mankind. The ten horns are the ten kings which thou sawest. God is trying to tell you what the secret is. Now take a look at this area here. This, we've already looked at this. This is the lower portion here. We saw that Star of David. We see that the Capitol building here and the National Mall going all the way up to Lincoln Memorial here. By the way, on the top, where that circle is, that's Lincoln's memorial. And on the bottom here, where this area is right here, that's Lincoln Park. So from this point here to this point up to the top there, we're going to see a design in the layout of Washington, D.C. The Sephiroth is there. Take a good look at it. And remember, the Sephiroth is the path of enlightenment in the Kabbalah, the tree of eternal life. Wow. Okay? Now, here is the Washington Memorial in Alexandria, Virginia. It is a Masonic lodge. Notice the square and compass there. They're telling you the secret. Heaven and earth mingled there. And here's what it looks from the outside. Notice that we have this tall structure here. And it was designed to look like the Freemasons' viewing or the Freemasons' opinion of what Solomon's temple looked like. Take a look at it. So here we have a representation of Solomon's temple. Guess what we find when we look at Solomon's temple? The last king to rule over Judah that really tripped God's trigger was Manasseh. He reigned 50 and 5 years. That's 55 years. Remember we saw Satan mentioned 55 times in the King James Bible? And guess what Manasseh did in Solomon's temple? He did 13 things, and the 13th thing that he did was he set up an idol in the house of God. Think about it. Think about what he's doing here and the secret that he's revealing in his actions, okay? Okay? Take a good look at this again. And they tell you that it's exactly 333 feet tall. This building is. Guess what I found? The word tabernacle is mentioned 333 times in the Old Testament of the King James Bible. Wow. 
Let's look at it again. Inside of this tabernacle, this temple, they have the Ark of the Covenant. Not the real one. A representation of it. And I noticed something here just in passing. That on the right hand side you have the showbread. There's only six loaves here. Okay? There's only six loaves there. Okay? Now, I want you to notice on the bottom there that this temple, its exact location is 38 degrees, 48 minutes, and 28 seconds. Now that's important because I want you to remember that because we're going to see it again. And that it's also located, if you see there in the bottom, 77 degrees uh, north uh, longitude. Now that's important and I'll tell you why here in a minute. Because exactly 13 degrees straight west of that is this location right here, noted by the star. Does anybody recognize that? Looks like it's the convergence of two rivers. Okay? Two rivers forming a new river. Okay? Remember what two things represented Freemasonry. Sons of God, daughters of men. And when they come together, they form a new thing. You follow me so far? That's the new race that they're talking about. By the way, this is the convergence of the Missouri River and the Mississippi River. Does anybody know what the flag of St. Louis, Missouri looks like? It denotes the convergence together of the two rivers into a new one. And notice that the symbol that they use is the symbol that Dan Brown said was the symbol for the Priory of Zion, denoting the bloodline. Okay? I got more than that. I don't know why this is, but I got more than that. Take a look at that. In front of the Ark of the Covenant, in Washington's memorial, you have the arch. Dun, dun, dun. Okay? Yeah? I don't know why it's there, but it's there. Okay? The Royal Arch of Freemasonry. And there in the middle of the arch is what's called the Keystone. What is the Keystone State? Pennsylvania. Why? Because it was at the center of the 13 colonies. Where was the Declaration of Independence written? Where was the original seat of our government? In the Keystone. Okay? And I'll tell you more about the Royal Arch here in a little bit. Up from the White House, 13 blocks exactly, you have the Masonic House of the Temple. There it is from the outside. Now I want you to notice that it looks funny, doesn't it? You have what looks like a, a, uh, a Greek Parthenon and on top of it, a step pyramid, okay? This was designed to be modeled after one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the ancient mausoleum, the temple, or the mausoleum of, I'm going to pronounce the name, Halicarnassus. I think that's how you pronounce his name, and I couldn't figure out why, but I know St. Louis, and I know that if you go to St. Louis, you're going to see that same thing, this is on the Civil Courts building in downtown St. Louis in a direct line from the St. Louis Arch. And I want you to notice that the face of, this, of the top of this building, you have, a, you have a temple which is four square, four sides, and you have a pyramid which is three sides. Now what's four plus three? Seven. Albert Pike explains what that number means and what that number represents. He says seven is the sacred number in all the theogenies and all the symbols because it is composed of three and four. Okay, three plus four is seven. So three represents the earthly realm, four represents the heavenly realm, and when you combine them together, you get seven. And seven represents the new race of men, the new bloodline. How many heads does the beast have? Seven heads, okay? He's telling you the secret. He says the square, therefore, is a natural and appropriate symbol of this earth. The compass is an equally natural and appropriate symbol of the heavens. The compass is the hermetic symbol of the creative deity, male, and the square of the productive earth or universe. He's telling you the secret of the square and the compass. The, the compass represents the heavenly, and, the, and the, um, the compass, did I say that? The compass represents the heavenly, the square represents the earthly, and they're mingled together. Sons of God, daughters of men. And what's in the middle of that square and compass? The G representing God's knowing good and evil. Okay? Take a look at it. Thou sawest that iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what this symbol represents. 
mingle themselves with the seed of men. Notice we have that same layout in Washington, D.C. You have the Capitol building at the base. You have Washington's monument at the top. The street layout makes the square and compass. And the phallic symbol of Washington's monument represents the sons of God. And that woman on top of the Capitol building represents daughters of men. Sons of God, daughters of men. Sons of God, daughters of men. Jacob and Boaz. Take a look at it. Sons of God, daughters of men. Notice the sun over one. Notice the moon over the other. Notice that Eve, he even calls them out, potter and mater, which is father and mother. And they form a child there in the center. Notice on the graphic on the right hand, you have on one column, Jacob, you have the symbol for the stars of heaven. And on the other column, you have a symbol for the earth. And they're united together. Sons of God, daughters of men. And what did we say that the pillars represented in the Bible? The DNA code, the human genome, the chromosomes. Are we learning the secret of Freemasonry? It's there in all of its symbols. Somebody say amen. Remember that story about the ladder in the Bible? Let's look at this verse. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And when Jacob saw this, he said, Lo, I, this is the house of God, and these are the gates of heaven. Did you know Freemasons use a ladder as one of their symbols? Look at the symbolism. Heaven united with earth. Sons of God, daughters of men. The latter is DNA. The bridge between heaven and earth. DNA, sons of God, daughters of men. How about the Tower of Babel? Take a look at it. They said, let us build us a tower whose top may reach where? Wow. It's interesting, isn't it? How many have ever heard of the Maypole? May Day. Look at what they're doing. They're twining the DNA on the pole that reaches from heaven to earth. Huh? It's a prophetic act. Okay? A pathetic act. Amen? A, path a prophetic act. And it represents the sons of God and daughters of men intertwining in the human DNA. And by the way, May Day is what day? May 1st? What day did, was the Illuminati formed in 1776? May 1st. Same day, the communist birthday. That's exactly right. Now we're learning some secrets, aren't we? We're understanding some secret things here. Are we starting to believe it now? Sons of God, daughters of men. Sons of God, daughters of men. From the Da Vinci Code in Rosalind Chapel, we find the apprentice pillar. Notice what it looks like. Reaching from earth to heaven. Combining heaven with earth in the DNA code. This was made 500 years ago. DNA structure combining heaven with earth. Have you ever heard of squaring a circle? Has anybody ever heard of that? Does anybody know what it means? I don't either. <laughs> yeah, it's, it has something to see. I'm not a mathematician, okay? I'm just not good at this stuff. And there was some of this that I didn't understand. Hopefully somebody watching this video, is, I'm not going to try to be smarter than they are, okay? Because I'm not, okay? But it, and what we found out that squaring a circle is an impossibility. Because to find the area of a circle, you use pi, and pi is an infinite number. It never has an end, so you can't use that number to have a square that matches this area of a circle. Notice Da Vinci in his Vitruvian Man. Notice what he's doing here. He's squaring the circle. See it in the middle there? He's squaring the circle. And when you go to draw a... And by the way, the circle represents the heavenly, and the square represents the earthly. Sons of God... Daughters of men, sons of God, daughters of men, and their offspring, the Vitruvian man, that's what da Vinci drew. And so Freemasonry has two main symbols. A compass which draws a what? A circle, the heavenly, the sons of God, and the compass which draws a 
or the square which draws a square, the earthly, sons of God and daughters of men, squaring the circle. Now look at, in Freemason lore, they have what's called the winding staircase. And when you go th between the two pillars of Jacob and Boaz, where the DNA is, and you ascend the winding staircase, that's where you find the light of Freemasonry in Solomon's new temple. Sons of God, daughters of men, DNA code. This is real stuff, isn't it? It's in all of their symbols. Have you ever seen this symbol before? Albert Pike in Morals and Dogma tells you what this symbol represents. It looks like a Christian symbol, doesn't it? You would think, wow, if I go to that church, they have Christians there. Actually, it's a Masonic symbol. Albert Pike said that the cross represents the heavens. Actually, the cross is a vulgar symbol. The cross represents the male. The crown represents the female. Sons of God, daughters of men. Sons of God, daughters of men. Are you getting it? So you pass by churches and you'll see, okay, that symbol there. I think it's an invitation. Okay? I think it's an invitation. Okay? I'll move on. The Pythagorean theorem. Here's another mathematics thing. I think I get this one. Okay? The Pythagorean I can't even say it. That. Okay? That right angle triangle up there. Take a look at it. This is a Freemason symbol. And it says, you know, now notice on that right angle triangle, notice the right angle, 90 degrees here. Okay? And on the left hand side, you have the area of one of those bases. And on the bottom side, you have the area of the other base. And the Pythagorean theorem says that the area of one base added to the area of the other base equals the area of the hypotenuse or that angled side. Does everybody follow me so far? Notice you can count the cubes there. 16 plus 9 will always equal 25. Okay? Albert Pike described this, I had to read it to find out what it was, and he told you what it was. He said that one of those bases represents heaven. And the other base represents, guess what? Earth. So one of the bases represents sons of God, and the other base represents daughters of men. So when you add those two together, you get the new children of Belial. The hybrid race. Okay? That's what that symbol represents. Guess where it's at? Washington, D.C. Okay? Perfectly laid out. Sons of God, daughters of men, a new hybrid race. Okay? What is a sphinx? Freemasons use this symbol. What is it? Half man. Half beast. And Albert Pike described the sphinx that is in Egypt by the three pyramids. And he said that sphinx is guarding the secret of Freemasonry, telling you what it is a hybrid race, half man, half beast. Sounds far fetched, I know, but what saith the scriptures? God said, My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my secret place, for robbers shall enter into it and defile it. The secret place was the temple, by the way. Leviticus 11 says, Whatsoever goeth upon the belly, and whatsoever goeth upon all four, notice that word, that number, whatsoever hath more feet among all creeping things that creep upon the earth, them shall ye not eat, for they are an abomination. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled thereby. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defy yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God said, don't do it. 
You'll defile your temple. Deuteronomy 22, thou shalt not sow thy vineyard. What did we say the vine represented? The double helix of DNA. With diverse seeds. Lest thy fruit of thy seed, which thou hast sown, and the fruit of thy vineyard, be defiled. 1 Corinthians 3, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Jude was describing the false prophets of the last days. And he said, Likewise, these filthy dreamers do what? They defile the flesh. This is where we're headed, folks. This is where all the religions, all of the religions are taking mankind right now, including... Laodicean Christianity. By the way, there's tons of videos back here, tons of information on the corruption of the King James Bible in the New Translations. Right? And remember that the book of this Bible is the same as the book of the DNA code that makes you and I, correct? So they defile this book Guess where they're going? They're going to defile the book of DNA. I'll show you that. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance for fashion, when as yet there was none of them. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. God said, don't add to the book and don't take away from the book. What are they doing in the genetic research world right now? They're adding to and taking away from the book. And God said, don't do it. Okay? God said, don't do it. So that leads us to this. Stem cells. Only discovered about five, ten years ago. It has opened up all kinds of realms of possibility. Things that only science fiction writers could dream up 50, 100 years ago. It is a major push in this country to get stem cell research going, isn't it? Okay? And by the way, they, these guys are not content with settling for adult stem cells. And there are plenty of them to go around. They're wanting the fetal tissue. Remember how God was angry with Israel because they took their babies and sacrificed them to Moloch? And why were they doing that? Because they had a God called Moloch that had to be appeased. And if they requested anything of their God, they had to offer up their children in order to get it. We're going somewhere with this because the abortion industry is not just something that is human nature or flesh oriented. It is spiritual in every sense of the word. And we're looking at a situation now where they are creating embryos in a laboratory. In essence, they are forming human beings as innocent as you can get them. And by the way, is that group of cells a human being? God said it was. God said that John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Isn't that what he said? We're talking about human life here. And they're creating, they're, they're, they're mixing those up in laboratories and then they kill those embryos to, uh, to bring out, to harvest the stem cells out of them. It's the same thing when the Israelites sacrificed their babies to Moloch. Same thing. But you see, stem cells are, are unique. And we, we just discovered this, like say, five, ten years ago. Because stem cells are the very beginnings of what we are as human beings or what any life is. Because when, when, a, when a child is conceived, it starts out as one cell, 
then divides into two, and then four, then eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, and so on. And in its initial phases, all it is is just a group of cells. But encoded, remember that verse? Remember that verse? When as yet there was none of them, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them, David was describing stem cells. Because he said all the DNA information is encoded there, they just have to branch out like a vineyard, okay? They just have to branch out. Because eventually, eventually those stem cells turn into skin cells, hair cells, blood cells, you name it, cells, and that's what they turn into. So the potential in a stem cell is unlimited. And science right now is figuring out how, how to take a stem cell and cause it to do whatever they want it to do. And right now they're able, what they are, they're able to grow body organs out of stem cells. They're growing a human heart out of a stem cell. They just tell it what to do and it begins to grow into a human heart in a laboratory. That's weird, isn't it? And they're promising everybody to cure all the diseases with it. That's what they're telling everybody they're going to be able to do. So let's take like sharks for a minute. Sharks don't get cancer, right? Let's just say sharks don't, but let's say sharks don't catch colds. You don't ever see a shark sneezing, do you? Okay, you never see them running around with a tissue holding, okay? Let's say sharks don't get cancer. So the genetic scientists, they look at the DNA sequence of a shark. They can read it like a book now. And they find the chapter and verse that prohibits a shark from getting cancer. And they take that out. And they find the right place in the human genome to stick that in there. So now humans don't get cancer anymore. This not, I'm not making this stuff up, folks. Do your research on it. This is what they're doing. You see, they want to be able to grow new spinal cords. Nobody's ever been able to do that before. Grow human hearts. Grow livers. Grow kidneys. Grow all kinds. Recreate the human body. This is where it's going. Scientists all over the world right now are busy while I'm talking right now learning how to fuse animal DNA and human DNA. They're learning how to do it. And stop and think about this for a minute. What is all this UFO stuff about? What are all the UFO movies? Remember the series Taken that Steven Spielberg put on? Okay, I watched all those episodes. Remember the X-Files? I talked about the X-Files and the Da Vinci Code. What was it all about? It was about alien-human hybrids. All the UFO stories about abduction, they're saying, well, they're, they're doing tests on us. And some of these, some of these uh, people who they call abductees, by the way, they were just influenced by demons, by the way. They, see, they said that we saw our hybrid children. They're learning how to make new creatures by hybridizing aliens and humans together. I mean, think about all this stuff. This is not just science fiction, folks. This is becoming science fact. Here's another one. These are called chimeras. All of ancient civilizations, they all have some sort of representation of a crossbreed between humans and animals. And in a lot of cases, it's humans and serpents or reptiles. Here's another article. This is not from some weirdo... Uh, place on the internet. This is uh, nationalgeographic.com. Clone pigs modified for use in human transplants. Making spare organs out of pig DNA and human DNA. Mice with human brains. Animal-human hybrid embryos, a reality by using the stem cells. Cows. What was it that they set up in the wilderness at the base of Mount Sinai? Golden calf. What was it that Jeroboam set up in Bethel and in Dan? A golden calf. Think about it. Think about what's going on here. Here is an artist's representation. This is not real. This is an artist's representation of a human dog. It's grotesque, isn't it? Okay? 
this is where we're headed. But remember, we're not talking about mixing earth beast DNA. Sons of God, daughters of men. And this is speculation right now, but I talked to a medical doctor in Ohio who said that this is where they're, who gave me verification on it, that this is where they could go with this. Let's say that they develop a stem cell. They develop a stem cell that has a mixture, a special mixture of DNA in it. Hybrid DNA. Sons of God, daughters of men. Once injected into a human being, changes his DNA. I'm going to show you this from the scriptures. Albert Pike said that the secret, the Grand Arcanum, he who possesses the Grand Arcanum is a genuine king, and more than a king, in all maladies of the soul and body, a single particle from the precious stone, a single grain of the divine powder is more than sufficient to cure him. The philosopher's stone. Daniel, remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel? What was given to Nebuchadnezzar for seven years? A beast's heart. God's telling you what's going to happen, isn't he? God's telling you what's going to happen. Now, I'm going to finish with this. I believe that all of this is headed based upon the numerics, based upon everything that we see, I believe that all of this is headed toward the mark of the beast. Somebody asked me, they said, well, what about you know, people who are the mark of the beast is forced upon them? I don't believe that. I think the scriptures tell us in Revelation 13 that the false prophet says he causes all. The word cause is interesting because it means that he brought about the circumstances by which people will voluntarily take this mark. And I believe that it's going to have something to do with maybe an outbreak of some kind on the earth that's killing everybody, and if you take this, you won't get it. I mean, that would be one way to do it, right? I think it's going to be more religious in nature than that. But it's interesting because God says whoever takes this mark they are doomed forever, aren't they? There'll be nobody who takes the mark that says, well, I didn't mean to. Because a beast heart is going to be given to them, won't it? Okay? And God will have to do with them exactly what he had to do with all flesh in the days of Noah. Destroy it. Okay? Now, I believe this is where we're headed, don't you? This is where we're headed. And I'm going to say this. God has an alternative. Remember the two seeds we were talking about? The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent? There's only two, right? You see, God believes in simplicity. And I like this number two in the Bible. When Adam is in the midst of the garden, he sees how many trees? Tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't eat of one, eat of the other, and you'll live forever. Amen? Okay? How many choices do we get for eternity? Heaven and hell. There's no third place. Amen? I just thought I'd throw that in there. God and Satan. Heaven and hell. God said, I set before you two choices. Life and death. He said, he begs us to choose life. But God has given us all free will. And he said, you choose. Only two choices. That's what makes McDonald's so complicated. Right? And I'm not just picking on McDonald's. But when you go to McDonald's, there's 14 choices of what you can have to eat. You ought to have just hamburger and McChicken. Amen? Just make it easy for everybody. God made it easy for everybody. He said two choices. Two choices. Now look at this verse up here, and I'm going to close with this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Look at the number, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, Get it? Because in all the, the religions in the world, even Freemasonry, in the occult, in the New Age movement, in Rosicrucianism, in, uh, in Mormonism, in all of these religions, they all have a version of being born again. Don't they? 
usually through initiations of various kinds. If you do this and do this and do this. By the way, when God said you can be saved, He didn't say you do anything. Because we are saved by grace through faith and not by works, lest any man should boast. Can I hear you say amen? Listen, I believe in free grace, don't you? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I, I saw this illustration in the scripture. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that uh, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe where? In our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You believe that? Say amen. Or do you believe that you have to go through rituals first? Or do you believe you have to be baptized? Or do you believe you have to be circumcised like Paul was talking about in Galatians? Or do you believe you have to pay money? Or do you believe you have to cross yourself or pray to Mary? Do you believe any of those things? No. God said it's free. Believe with thy heart and confess with thy mouth. Now watch this. God always illustrates his doctrine. Here on the cross... You have Jesus, the Son of God, dying for the sins of mankind. On one side of Jesus is a mocker, a scorner. If thou be the Son of God, bring thyself down. Show everybody. He's mocking Jesus. On the other side of Jesus is a man. Watch this. He believes that Jesus is Lord, and he confesses him with his mouth. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, he said that to a dying man on a cross, didn't he? This thief on the cross confessed that Jesus was his Lord, and he believed in his heart that even though he was going to die on that cross, he knew that he was going to live again, didn't he? He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And notice, what, notice now in the condition of his body right now. He is tied, strapped down to a cross. Can he cross himself? Can he genuflect? Can he pay money? Can he do anything? No, except believe and confess. And that's what he did. And Jesus received that. He didn't even say, now, where's water now so we can baptize you? He said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. See, I believe in free grace. I believe that you have two choices. You either don't do anything or you believe and you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You can even find a religion where you can go through rituals and jump through hoops. It can be as, as easy as, as one cult or it can be as complicated as another. And at the end of that, you'll still die and go to hell. By the way, I'm a preacher that believes in hell. Why? The Bible said so. Okay? And you've got a choice. You can either believe what they tell you and you can be born again through corruptible seed or of incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You know what I know about this book? It lives. Because it's the book of life, isn't it? DNA, the book, they're all the same thing. This book is life. What was it that Jesus said when everybody was leaving him? He looked at his disciples and he said, Will you also depart from me? And they said, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so, my friend, you've got two choices. You can hang on to the cults. You can hang on to the mystery religions. You can hang on to Freemasonry and all of its rituals and all of its levels and all of its work salvation. And you can attempt to wear your lambskin apron in front of God, which you say represents your righteous deeds, which God says there is none righteous, no, not one. Or you can simply rely upon the blood of Jesus Christ and his word to save your soul. That's what I believe. I have decided to be born again on the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. And I want you to be there with me. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Now I'm going to ask you, if you would, just bow your head, close your eyes. I told them that I would do this. And I don't know who you are. I'm assuming by your amen and me that you're all right. Okay? 
But if you're here tonight, God's ringing your bell. And you know that this book is the inspired Word of God. And you've either never accepted Christ as your Savior. You've acted Christian all your life. You may have been raised in church. You may have performed acts in your church that made it look like you were really something. But inwardly, you know better. Inwardly, you know better. I want to tell you something tonight. There's freedom in Jesus Christ. God can free you from that bondage that you're in. If you're here tonight and you've never been saved, God made it so simple. I was nine years old when I got saved. My son here, Matthew, he was about six or seven. It's simple. You just believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and that you're a rotten, filthy, low-down, hell-deserving sinner. You've got to believe that one first because if you don't, you're too full of pride. If you're here tonight and you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, would you raise your hand? I'm going to pray for you. Or maybe you're here tonight with every head bowed, every eye closed. And you just admit to me, and I'm, I'm not going to say nothing. The camera's not on you or nothing. You say, Brother Mike, God's ringing my bell tonight. Man, I like what you had to say, but the truth is the Holy Ghost is dealing with me right now. I'm not where I need to be with God. Would you just slip up a hand, maybe a finger, or just a nod or whatever? Say, so Brother Mike, thank you for your honesty. God bless you. Anybody else? Thank you for your honesty. I'm not where I ought to be with Christ. And Brother Mike, I saw what you're talking about, and I see it coming. And this whole thing's fixing to wind down really fast, and I'm going to have to decide whose side I'm going to be on. I'm going to ask you right now, in your heart and in your mind, you pray, dear God, I'm sorry. My heart is wicked. There is no good thing in me. I've heard the truth. I know the truth. I just chose not to live it. God, would you forgive me? God, would you bring restoration to my life? God, teach me how to trust you. I don't care how hard it is. God, you teach me how to trust you. So that when it all wraps up, I'm on the right side. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I've come before you, dear God, and I thank you, Lord, for this place. I thank you, Lord, for this meeting. God, I was sincere in my heart, dear God. Lord, you asked me, Lord, for I even come down here, dear God, to question my motives of why I was doing this. And Father, Lord, you said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And Father, I don't have, you know, I don't have an axe to grind with anybody. But Lord, you've asked me to stand as a watchman on the wall and see the sword coming. And God, I see it coming. You've asked me to blow the trumpet of the Word of God. And Lord, I'm blowing it. And Lord, Father, I really, I'm not like, Lord, I don't want to be like Jonah who went and preached and didn't care whether they got saved or not. God, I care. I care whether or not somebody is delivered from Freemasonry. I care whether or not, God, somebody's brought out of the occult. I care whether or not, dear God, whether a cold, back, backslidden Christian, dear God, comes back on their knees begging you, Lord, for mercy, God, because I know you'll give it to them because you did me. And Father, Lord, I care for these people right here, Lord. I don't know them. I don't know if I'll see them again this side of heaven. But God, Lord, you brought them here. And I ask, dear God, Lord, that you'd send them home, dear God, with a new spirit. Just like David said. When he sinned that awful sin, God, he redid it right in your eyes and you saw it. And he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away. I just pray, Heavenly Father, God, Lord, that you would cause these people to cry out unto you, dear God, to say, Lord, cast me not away. Father, thank you, Lord, for this meeting. Bless these people, dear God, Lord. Give them your love. Give them your testimony, Lord, through the word of God. And blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.